Welcome everyone. My name is Rebecca Blumenstein and I'm a Deputy Managing Editor at the New York Times. And I'm very pleased to introduce today's panel to delve deeply into the question, what the heck is going on with the US economy? Inflation is soaring at its fastest pace in 40 years. Markets haven't been as volatile since the financial crisis with the S&P 500 breaking through to bear market levels last Friday before sharply rebounding today. The Fed has started to raise interest rates to combat inflation with the highest increase in more than 20 years as it tries to engineer a soft landing. Unemployment remains at historic lows. Employers can't find enough workers coming out of the pandemic and supply chain problems threaten to get worse with the lockdowns in China. Here to make sense of it all are four people with a unique and important perspective. Senator Pat Toomey, who has represented Pennsylvania in the Senate since 2011. Jason Furman, a professor of economic policy at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government and former chair of President Obama's economic advisors. Adina Friedman, president and CEO of NASDAQ. And Dan Schulman, who is president and CEO of PayPal. We're going to have a discussion and then open it up for questions old fashioned style with microphones for you since we are gratefully here in person. Uh, but Adina, I'd like to start off with you. Um, the markets are back a bit today, but 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 tech stocks um, are down to really their their lowest level since uh, 2001 when the tech bubble burst. And Nasdaq last I looked was down more than 30 percent. What's going on with the markets and tech in particular? Well, you just described what's going on with the markets, right? So <laughs> all of the ingredients that you started discussing at the very beginning are really making it very difficult for investors to predict the future. And when you think about markets, markets, especially stock markets, they're really all about the future value of companies and how do you look at the, the, the opportunity for future earnings. It is very difficult right now to take all of those externalities and, and all those, those uh, intermixing uh, signals and try to determine how do you put a discounted cash flow value on any company right now in that context, right? And I think that that is, a, that is a, you know, when that happens, investors tend to take a risk off approach. A, a selling decision is much easier than a buying decision. Um, and the result is the markets react. Uh, so I think that in the end, though, there are, you know, I think a lot of differences between the current situation and what happened back in the late 90s and, and early 2000s. So, you know, the, certainly the, the multiples of companies that were listed in the U.S. back then were significantly higher than they were even at the peak now, um, which was at the end of last year. And you're seeing a, a significant trough developing today. So I think at the end of the day, any of those unknowns that you just mentioned, inflation, the geopolitical unrest, um, the Fed actions, uh, as well as just employment, you know, having more room in the, in the economy to allow us to continue to grow in terms of labor. I think all of this, any of one of those that starts to resolve itself or show some positive signals will give positive signals to, to the markets to give more certainty to investors. And I'm hopeful that we can manage our way through this situation and still continue to see growth in the economy. So more optimistic than pessimistic. I tend to be an optimist, though, yes. <laughs> So, Dan, what is it like from your perspective? PayPal has down, um, like a lot of tech companies, quite significantly uh, in the last six months. Does this feel to you, I mean, there's been so many predictions of the tech bubble bursting, I mean, almost for 20 years. Does it feel like we're in something profoundly different now as a CEO? Well, I think Adina put it reasonably well. I think you've got a number of externalities that have increased the magnitude of uncertainty. And so all of us, uh, you know, are taking a conservative view. Uh, we're also, on the tech side, growing over tremendous growth during the uh, pandemic. I mean, people were locked in their homes. They had no nowhere to go. They had to do everything online, whether it be exercise classes or shopping. And so we're growing over that growth uh, at the same time. So um, I think... There's a big difference. You know, many of the companies today, uh, including PayPal, we have very strong free cash flow. We'll do $5 billion of free cash flow this year, uh, very strong balance sheets. I think it's just a matter of these externalities playing out, kind of figuring out as we uh, hopefully are coming out of the pandemic, not into another one, but out of the pandemic, into a more normalized world, and then you go straight into inflation at 40-year 40 40 year highs, uh, you know, supply chain shocks to the system, 
I think um, we're trying to figure out what normalized growth looks like. Uh, and I think we're just all taking a conservative view of that right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so, so the underlying demand is still strong. We're not seeing a burst in your... In I mean, your look, you say the tech industry. Uh, I would say I look out in the room here. What industry is not a tech industry right now? I mean, like we are all moving more and more towards mm -hmm. digital means, digital technologies. Uh, every company is a tech company today. So I think um, you've got what you classically think of Silicon Valley companies, but you know most companies out here would argue they're tech companies. Senator, how is this playing out on the ground in your district in Pennsylvania? It feels like it's almost a whipsaw. Uh, obviously, a huge concern about inflation, but it's never been easier to, to, to get a job. Yeah, I think the, uh, the problem on the ground for a uh, you know, working family in Pennsylvania is that um, wages are rising. They can, they can have a job, but inflation is rising faster. And this is uh, very frequently the problem, inflation doesn't doesn't have any sort of uh, uh, built-in constraints, but wages tend to move in cycles, and it's only periodic that you get a pay raise and so on. So, um, yes, by some measures, the economy is quite strong. Um, the people who own their own homes have more equity in the home than they ever have. Balance sheets are generally pretty good. Job opportunities are out there. But I think the highest inflation in 40 years puts more than a damper on things. It is it is very disturbing for most most people. And Jason, you're the economist on the stage. Um, what, what concerns you the most of that list that I went through? Is it inflation? Um, is, it, is it the Fed and, and, and just the, the, this historic move? What do you think we should be most concerned about? Yeah, look, I, I think it's a glass partly full um, on the incredibly strong job gains we've seen, the incredibly strong consumer spending. Consumers tell pollsters they're really pessimistic, they're really <coughs> depressed, everything's awful and then they go out and spend a lot of money. <laughs> um, we don't know how long that'll last, but it keeps lasting uh, month after month. Um, and you know, just overall pace of the economic recovery, that's all on the positive side. Um, inflation is at a 40-year high, is on the negative side. Um, real wage growth, inflation-adjusted wages are falling at the fastest pace they've fallen um, in 40 years. So this is a real, real problem um, for people for most people, they had a job last year, they have a job this year. What matters to them is that they're getting a once in a generation pay cut, um, real pay cut. Um, going forward, um, how does the Fed navigate this? There is a happy story where this inflation was all transitory and team transitory was right. They just sort of were 12 months off. Um, I think that's possible. Um, I think it's 25% chance. I think it's worth hoping for that. But there's a lot of inertia in this. Inflation expectations are higher. Wages lead to prices. Prices lead to wages. Um, and it's, you know, even if we had a recession, that might take half a point or a point off of our inflation, might not get it to where the Fed wants it to be. Um, and so that's what worries me. I think there's also one other uh, thing playing out right now. Consumer balance sheets went up tremendously with all the government stimulus. You had the average savings account go up from about $400 to about $2,000. You know, as I look out, as others uh, think about this, if inflation stays where it is, those savings and, and the spend continues, those savings go back down by the end of this year or the beginning of next year to that four or $500 level. And I think at that point, you're gonna really see, a, um, we are already seeing reduction in spend in lower income levels for sure that's moving up to middle income right now. So I think we, we've got numerous interweaving things that are happening right now that just, it's not just consumer spend. A lot of that was government stimulus, and that's not here anymore. And, and I, I think it's important to make the point, it, this might be a moment for a little government humility. Um, think about what happened you know, in April, I guess it was, of 2020. With the lockdown, economy looks like it's crashing. We're worried about markets freezing up. And there was a massive response, right? And it was bipartisan. It was almost unanimous in Congress. I was part of it. And we stood up these facilities by the Fed. Um, but we, we ended up having about a $2 trillion hole, and we filled it with $6 trillion of spending. Yeah. And at the same time, we had a massive expansion of the monetary money supply. And we had the Fed buying $1.4 trillion worth of bonds 
um, mortgages and treasuries at an, at an annual rate, and they kept doing it a year and a half easily after we were clearly out of the woods, right? We had 30% GDP growth in the third quarter of 2020, and there we are still buying these bonds. My point is, I think we did way too much, and now one of the ways we pay the price for that is uh, this inflation that we're living with. Adina and Jason, yeah, I, I'd love to get you in on this. Jason, you were in the Obama administration during the financial crisis, and it was said for so many years that that, that the stimulus wasn't big enough, and, and I think that that's a, a lesson that President Biden and his advisors took. Did, did, they, yeah. did they go too far on the other side? Yeah, I, I think we did too little. Um, I think we had political constraints and did the most we possibly could, given the politics we had at the time. Others may debate you know, whose fault it was and the like, um, but it was too little. And the recovery was too slow and too painful. Inflation was incredibly low for a long period of time. Interest rates was incredibly low for a period of time. Um, a couple of years ago, Ben Bernanke, Tim Geithner, and Hank Paulson convened a con conference to learn the lessons of the last guy for this and make sure you didn't repeat them. And a lot of these conferences at places like Brookings was sort of a waste of time. Um, this one worked really well. All the lessons were learned. We didn't make any of the same mistakes. We made brand new mistakes um, this time. Of a bigger man. And, and I think part of it was something the senator said. In April, it looked like a second Great Depression. By even July, the unemployment rate was, I think, down to something like 8 or 9%, which was terrible. But it wasn't the 15 or 20 that the CBO and others were forecasting. And so it was less bad than people realized. And it took a while to adjust to that. And by 2021, the main problem was people not taking jobs, not um, there not being enough jobs, and that's not a problem the Fed has can solve. But, you know, from your perspective, did the government over, overreach? And, and um, you have an interesting, I, I want to get into the Fed, but uh, did the Fed act uh, too slowly here? Well, I think, first of all, I think that the Fed and the government in general had to look at a cliff that they were facing at the beginning of COVID. And they also had to learn their lessons from the last crisis to say, let's act fast, let's act decisively, and let's act big. And they did all of those things, which I think at the time we all, we all said that was the right thing to do. And I think in hindsight, you can say, okay, that was the right move to make at the time. The question is, when do you take your foot off the gas? And I think that's the challenge is that on the back of what was happening in the economy, when you really looked at the recovery, the recovery was quite uneven. So there were sectors in the economy that were booming on the back of the, the monetary stimulus and the fiscal stimulus. Those were two things that were just pouring money into certain parts of the economy. But there were parts of the economy, especially small businesses, on the ground businesses, that were not doing well at all and that were still really suffering. And I think the Fed was looking at both ends of the spectrum and trying to figure out how they kind of bring that other end of the spectrum along before they change policy. And that was a, that was a, hard, that's a hard calculus when on top of that you had the supply chain shocks that were much more lasting than I think anyone predicted, and particularly since we're still dealing with COVID lockdowns in the world today, right? Um, and at the same time, you then had the geopolitical unrest, which really threw the energy markets into a totally different space that the Fed could have predicted either. So if you kind of look at all the facts that they had to deal with and contend with, you know, hindsight's always 2020. But you could argue that they were looking at things a little through a different lens than they see it today. Today, they seem quite committed to tamping down inflation. And they're, you know, they seem to be saying they're on a road to do that. And we should, you know, that seems like a road that is, they are marching down that road pretty clearly. And I think that, you know, my hope is that they're able to do it successfully without just choking off the growth of the country. That's, that's the big risk now. Mm -hmm. Dan, you're a CEO running a company and, and trying to navigate all of this. You're also navigating rising interest in Bitcoin and, and, um, and, and all sorts of, of, of different ways of, of, of digital payment, that the blockchain, all these, all these, uh, all these things. Do you, did, the, did the Fed make it harder for you, um, in a sense, to, to run your company and to, to navigate all of this by waiting as long as it yeah. did? There's a lot of that. Disconnected questions there, but um, <laughs> let me try and answer the, the best I can. <laughs> um, first of all, I think um, I think inflation is going to be with us uh, for some time. Uh, right now, I um, um, even though people are spending, I think it's because their bank accounts uh, are inflated, and that will come down. Um, I do think consumer confidence is at low points in Europe. It's at a fifty. 
a year low right now. Based on my conversations with leading retailers around the world, uh, you know, none of us think that things are going to uh, come back by the end of this year. I mean, we are all planning for inflation to remain high, for supply chain shocks. It's going to take some time to work out. Uh, China basically went into shutdown. A lot of companies right now are reorienting their supply chains to different parts of the world. That's going to cause slowdown as well until that's uh, uh, complete. And so I think um, we, we just need to, to know that it's, there's going to be, at least at the low end and the medium part of the market, uh, I think a slowdown uh, in spending. I think um, one of the interesting second order effects that happened um, out of the war in Ukraine is that we weaponized uh, SWIFT and we created what were very neutral financial rails and we turned that into somewhat of a weapon. And, um, and therefore you have a lot of parts of the world right now um, that have been somewhat silent uh, on um, what's happening in the Ukraine, looking at, like, is the dollar really the currency that they can count on? Is SWIFT the rails that they can count on? Are they looking at some form of digital currencies going forward? And they all are at this point. Digital currencies are fundamentally different than cryptocurrencies. Cryptocurrencies are really an, an asset class right now, and, and they're a volatile asset class. Um, and when things are a volatile asset class, they're a terrible currency. Um, and, you know, um, and so I think we should separate out, you know, what is the price of, you know, Bitcoin, what's happening with Luna and Terra and algorithmic stable coins and that kind of thing, versus what's going on with digital currencies right now and is that in the strategic interest of various countries to promote that, and why? Um, and, and you're uh, talking about central bank digital currencies. I'm talking about central bank issued digital currencies, and obviously, uh, China um, with the digital RMB is thinking hard and heavy about that. But 80% of the central banks around the world are thinking about that. Mm -hmm. So I, I think one of the things, and I'd love to get your perspective on this, Dan, but the um, potential of stable coins. Yeah. Obviously, the stable coin takes out the volatility. And we, um, so full disclosure, I've got legislation that would create a yeah. regulatory framework that I think makes sense for stable coins that are, in fact, asset backed, yeah. not the algorithmic stable coins. The main reason, by the way, is that the algorithmic stable coins don't have the same kind of mechanical connection to the traditional That's financial right. system. And so the failure might be tragic for individuals, but it's not clear that it leads to systemic failure. Whereas the more, if I can say, conventional stable coins, <laughs> um, they could, right? They, they would certainly connect. Um, I, I think we ought to have a framework that allows privately issued stable coins to thrive in a, in a sort of rational uh, framework. And if, if that happened, I'm not sure how much we need a central bank digital dollar because I could see stable coins playing that role, but I wonder what. But now, can I just ask you? Yeah. So, do you see them then? You're acting. A lot of people like equate them to a money market fund. So, do you kind of see them in that kind of same same genre, or do you see them as? I see you say, saying they're going to play a different role, but having the regulation kind of govern it that way. So, I, I see the analogy, and I think that is a very analogous uh, instrument. I, uh, if you look at the president's working group, they suggested that all stable coins must be issued by insured depository institutions, which I think is way too narrow. Mm -hmm. I don't think that makes sense. And, for, and, you know, we don't have the FDIC insuring money market accounts. I don't think we right. should have the FDIC. That's why I was asking insuring. whether you see money market. I, I, yeah. I don't. So, so I'm, I'm hoping we don't go down that. I think I mean, for a lot of countries around the world, I think central bank digital currencies might make sense. I don't think the United States needs to do them. I think you can do one in US dollars just as easily um, as the Fed could. Stable coins, to me, seem like a solution in search of a problem, just like everything else in this space. Um, I haven't studied your legislation. I guess I'd worry two things, not having seen it at all, but that, that's not going to stop me. Okay. Um, one, I worry that money market <laughs> funds are already underregulated. 
and we're already in I a position over where again. we could have okay. where we could have a run in the future as long as you're pricing it at a dollar and everyone thinks it's a dollar. Two, once you have regulation, I know you would never ever want this, but you're putting a government imprimatur on something. And is the government going to have to rescue it if all this money goes into it? Are people going to start thinking of it like money with an implicit government guarantee? I'd almost rather people understand it's sort of the Wild West, you know, caveat emptor. It's well, I think yeah. that the debate on stable coins versus central bank digital currencies is who are the issuers, right? So if it's a central bank digital currency, in a way they're stepping in front of the private banking system to determine, to establish account, direct accounts with consumers. So you have to set it in a, in some sort of intermediary there to act as that. And so there's a little bit of a scope creep concern on central bank digital currencies, whereas a stable coin could be issued by a private institution backed by government fiat in a way that allows that intermediation to happen more naturally. But at the same time, these are all theoretical because neither of them exist in the United States. I mean, they exist, but they're not used in this way yet. For, for, you have to think of it as when it becomes general commerce and creating 24-7 payment capabilities globally. That, that's actually a great common good if we can do it. And these are technologies that could enable that, but you have, it comes with a lot of different consequences. I want to get if back to the- If the CBDC has, oh, sorry. No, no, no. You want to do something <laughs> Has interest. Um, then you've just nationalized the retail banking system. And, that's and if it doesn't point. have interest, you've just gotten people to put their money in something that's a lot worse deal than you know, where else they could be putting it. Uh, unless you they're using it totally so, for So I think it's sort of a means of exchange. So means, it's a means of exchange, it's, yeah, means of exchange right. Um, but I don't, you know, I don't know. Dan, let's go to you, and then I want to go to the broader impact of the Ukraine. Yeah, war. I think people always conflate four different things when they talk about crypto or digital currencies. There's kind of cryptocurrencies that are an asset class that people trade in. Then there is kind of programmable money, which is something very interesting where you can add utility to payments by creating software around that payment that allows you to do something you couldn't have done in just the traditional payment sphere. And I think that's very interesting. There's stable coins, and I think stable coins actually have a, some very interesting uh, use cases to them. They have to be backed one by one by fiat currency. It can't be, like, yeah, and you have to disclose it. And I, I think the legislation that you're looking at, I think, is very helpful in doing that. But to Adina's point on a stable coin, if you have a stable coin, it's 24 by 7. It's something you can fundamentally reorient B2B. For instance, 24 by 7, no intermediaries could take costs out of the system. I think they're real use cases for a stable coin that are tremendously interesting, but it's got to have trust and it's got to be backed completely. And then you have central bank issued digital currencies, which, you know, uh, many of us have, you know, different opinions, like how could that work? What, is it necessary? Why? But there you have the, you have the full faith and backing of the government behind that central bank issued digital it's just, it's that technological advancement of, of money. So you, exactly. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's the way to look and at it. And the programmable feature, I think, is huge. Yeah. I think we can't, probably can't even imagine the applications that will come about from the ability to build into, um, into money itself an automatic transaction that occurs based on some extraneous event that's verifiable. Yeah. That's, I think, going to be a big deal. Yeah. I do too. Senator, uh, many of your colleagues, a number of your colleagues are here today, um, uh, obviously talking about the bipartisan consensus be behind the $40 billion package right. that was approved um, late last week. Uh, what, are, what do you think? I mean, it's clear that this, this, this war is not going to end anytime soon. What, how do you think it's going to play out? And a question for all of you in the U.S. economy, the, 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 you know, the things that, that will be negatives and the things that are, that are positives. Well, I, I do think it's important to note that there's been overwhelming bipartisan support for this, right? I mean, there is a, there is a wing of the Republican Party that has been very skeptical about multinational commitments, NATO, the, the value of uh, our involvement. Turns out, I think that was a test uh, on the Senate floor, uh, whatever, a couple of weeks ago, last week. And 80% of Republicans who think we've spent way too much money and are apoplectic about the size of our debt nevertheless voted for $40 billion more, because there is still a, evidently a consensus <coughs> on the importance of standing with allies under circumstances like this. I think one of the, one of the big effects that I'm worried about um, unfolding is in, um, in food prices. 
right? We, we know, obviously, Ukraine is a huge exporter of grain. So is Russia, for that matter. If that Ukrainian grain can't get out from their southern ports, and if it can't get through the Black Sea, then I think we've got serious problems. I'm told anecdotally, and I don't know what the data suggests yet, but that America's crop may not be a great crop just because of some, some weather events. So some of our agricultural commodities may be um, just less prolific than we'd, we'd like them to be. So um, those are a couple of the worries that, that I have. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and, and um, do you, Adina, do you think that this is going to, in terms of retail investors and um, it was such a big, you know, it was such a big uh, part of the pandemic, people getting into the market in a, in a bigger way than they'd been. Is that going to, are some of these dynamics going to change the psychology of the market in a sense? I mean, I, I, I would just start saying just the Ukraine conflict and, and the war there, I think, is creating a lot of just sense of uncertainty. And I think we're starting to understand some of the economic impacts of that. So we have some of the knowns be known. But the fact is, conflict is always very unpredictable. And so the question really is, how far does it go? How much further does it go? Um, and obviously, the, the tragedy of the human loss definitely weighs on everyone's minds. So I think all of that can have a significant impact on investor psyche in general. But it's not, not just with the retail, right? So this is institutional investors and others who have to look at the calculus. They, they'll look at the direct first order impact of a business's business <coughs> and their, their exposure to that region as number one. The secondary impacts on energy prices, food prices, and other things that could become major externalities for them as number two. And then the third is just the unpredictable out, you know, next moves and where could this go in, in terms of bleed over into other parts of the economy or other parts of the world. So I think that's where you end up getting, as I said before, kind of a risk off approach that comes with this level of uncertainty that's happening. I think, oh, sorry. Uh, you know, for Ukraine, the loss can't even be measured in terms of GDP. Um, it's, it's just so enormous. Outside of Ukraine, Russia, far and away, vastly the biggest loser um, economically. Europe faces a much greater risk than the United States because the increase in the price of natural gas and the reliance on natural gas has been enormous. And I don't think Europe has made the set of adjustments it needs to, for example, keeping nuclear reactors going in Germany um, to respond to that. Um, the United States, I think it is much less scary for me for the economy um, than it was um, two months ago. Now, if Russia attracts Poland, if they use tactical nuclear weapons, there's a lot of things out there. But $105 oil, the US economy, which produces you know, as much as it consumes, things like that, um, you know, we, we can really handle. So I don't think it's existential for us at all. There, there's actually, don't take this the wrong way, but there, there's a huge economic opportunity. So my state of Pennsylvania, if we were an independent country, we'd be the fourth or the fifth biggest producer of natural gas in the world. And we're not drilling much, and there's a whole lot more under the ground. And the reason we don't drill it is because we refuse to build the infrastructure to bring it to markets. So Pennsylvania natural gas traded in Pennsylvania is almost always at a significant discount to gas throughout the rest of the country because all the pipelines are full. Um, it's not hard to imagine if we expanded that capacity, we could dramatically increase LNG exports to Europe. L you know, Europe's not going to be completely independent of natural gas. Why not burn American gas instead of Russian gas? It's, it's, it's a huge opportunity. Uh, Dan, uh, I want to ask you all predictions about the p likelihood of a recession. But before I do, supply chain rethinking. Um, we, we, we talked briefly about China uh, and, and more lockdowns there. What are you hearing in the tech world? Is this really a moment where there's going to be reshoring that, that will be net? All this uncertainty might, might yield a net benefit to the US, to Mexico, to North America? Yeah, well, remember, the uh, private sector um, has played a, uh, a role, obviously, in the sanctions that have happened. You know, we, in general, I think everybody is pulled out of Russia. We uh, have enabled services into the Ukraine. And for instance, over the PayPal platform now, we've been able to direct humanitarian aid or direct uh, to individuals in the Ukraine over $700 million by over 8 million people around the world 
uh, that have donated to that. Um, and I think, um, you know, businesses are now engaged in that, in that, um, and that's in the world stage right now. I think as we think about, I think Adina was saying this, the possible spillover effects, that becomes worrisome. Uh, Russia is one thing, China is a very different thing uh, on that. And I think trying to figure out how we maintain that sense of globalization, that this isn't a, against, but somehow we are, we can be competing, but work together at the same time. I think that's very important. At the same time, though, there's no question companies are trying to figure out how to be more resilient in their supply chain, anticipating what could happen, um, and then diversifying. So it's incremental cost to go and do that, that can add uh, pricing pressure. It will take time for that to happen. Um, and in the meantime, you know, it will affect uh, supply chains. But I think um, all businesses are imagining kind of scenarios like what could go wrong as opposed to like what could go right and preparing for that. Um, before I open it up for questions, I'd like to ask our panelists. Uh, President Biden said today that a recession is not inevitable. Um, and, and to all of you, what, what is the probability, would you say, of a, of a recession? And Jason, I want to start with you first. <laughs> um, uh, certainly somewhere between 1 and 99, which is what the <laughs> uh, inevitable means. Uh, my baseline for the next year is always 15%. That sort of roughly is how the economy functions. You roll a die, you get one, you get a recession. Two through six, um, you don't. I'm a little bit higher than 15 right now because of all this existential uncertainty and problem we've been talking about, but not much higher than it. Um, we heard about all the extra money people had. People that got $2.3 trillion of extra money above and beyond what they spent, they spent off about $100 billion of it in the first four months of this year. That money could last a while. Um, there's about 1.5 million workers who are out of the labor force since COVID. I think a lot of them will come back. A lot of them will need to come back because of some of the economic problems we're talking about. There's more room for businesses to add to their inventories. So I think on the one-year horizon, there's a number of positive things. I get more worried about sort of one to two years from now, where I think the Fed goes above 3%, maybe to four, maybe to five, and what that means. But that's more like a year and a half, two and a half years from now, um, where I get more worried. The Senator? Yeah, I, I might be um, a little bit more worried uh, than Jason in the short term. I'm a little more optimistic longer term. I, I, I think the market is uh, going to help a lot, you know, the, the backup in yields, the strength of the dollar. We're already actually seeing some demand destruction. I mean, Dan referred to sales growth, but that's nominal growth. It's not in real terms. Mm -hmm. And we're starting to see a little bit of margin compression, at least among the big retailers. We'll see what other earnings numbers start to look like. So um, I, I wouldn't be surprised if we see a little bit more of a slowdown sometime this year. But I'm, I'm quite bullish about the, the medium term. Adina, the markets. Well, I mean, first of all, I think that the markets are definitely saying it's a non-zero risk of having a recession. Um, I also would say, though, that some of that slowdown that you just referred to is actually what the Fed is trying to achieve, right? So, you know, by taking a very hopefully consistent approach to increasing rates for some period of time to kind of normalize back to something that we actually even didn't achieve pre-pandemic, by the way, right, to try to get rates up back up to a more normalized level, I think that that will, it is meant to slow down the economy. Now, the question is just, does it get to a tipping point? And I think all of the things you just mentioned are kind of like these really strong functions that will make it so that the, there's just a lot of money. There's a ton of money in the system. There's a ton of investable money in the markets. There's a lot of money that the government has created to be put into the system that still hasn't yet been spent. Um, and so I, I, I have to say, I'd like to think that those positive forces even if you say we, we ever did it, <laughs> those positive forces will countervail what the Fed's trying to do to slow down inflation. I think the big issue is consumer confidence, right? So if consumer confidence really continues to go south, the markets continue to show a lot of wobbliness and, and a lack of a foundation to give savers an understanding of where their portfolio sits. 
and that confidence continues to drop, that's, that to me can become self-fulfilling into recession. So that's where I see the non-zero risk, but I'm not willing to put a percentage on it. <laughs> <laughs> Look, if we had 1.7 growth this year, I think there'd be people in the Fed doing backflips and celebrating. Uh, right. It's just they're, they're trying to find a way to get to that, that, that stable, stable point that then we can lift off of from there. And the question is, does it just go too far? That's the big issue. Dan. But optimistic, pessimistic, you don't have to. In general, I'm an optimist um, who worries a lot. I think <laughs> <laughs> I stole that from Madeleine Albright, by the way. But, um, um, but I think it accurately <laughs> describes me. Um, like I think in Europe, the chances of recession are much higher than, uh, than here in the, uh, in the US. Um, And I wouldn't, I wouldn't put a number on either because the truth of the matter is we don't know. We don't know. Um, I think it depends on how long does the war go on, um, confidence, supply chain, um, you know, can the Fed n navigate this kind of softer landing? It's, it's unclear. And what I said in the beginning, I'll reiterate now, I think the magnitude of uncertainty is greater than we've seen in a long time. And so for any of us to accurately predict, um, I think it would be very difficult to do. Well said, and I'm struck, I must say, by the, by the consensus on this panel, uh, bipartisan as well, about what got us into the situation and, and what may get us out. I'd love to open it up for those old-fashioned in-person questions, if anybody has one. Um, I have plenty, but anyone? I see a hand here. Thank you. Uh, Lori Esposito Murray, Committee for Economic Development. Um, Senator and um, Jason, I, I'd really like to ask you, there's been a lot of emphasis on the monetary side. On the fiscal side, with the increase in interest rates, we're going to see our debt and, um, payment uh, go up. How, how do you think this is going to affect where we go in terms of deficits and debt. Will we be spending more, um, even though we can't afford it? So I'll go first, if you don't mind. Um, so, you know, let's be honest. Um, about half the Senate wants to do yet another big spending bill on something on the order of a trillion dollars if they can get that done. I think that's a bad idea, but that's very much still alive and well. I'm, I've been frustrated by Congress and, and administration's unwillingness to deal with the fundamental driver of our long-term structural imbalance, which are the entitlement programs, growing faster than our economy year in and year out, decade in and decade out. And I started to get to the view that it's going to take some kind of exogenous shock to get people to really focus on this. When, when debt hits 100% of GDP, which is almost that now, if we have a normalization of interest rates that sort of, if normal means something like what most of my adult life it's looked like, the cost of serv serv servicing that is huge. So ultimately, that has to put pressure on spending. I'm hoping it puts pressure on us to make some structural changes to the programs that drive that. I'm also an optimist who worries a lot. <laughs> um, the debt is about ninth on my worry list. It's not absent from it, but the market expects the 10-year to be, I think, 3.5% by a decade from now. It's below 3% right now. Um, with 2% inflation, um, the debt service on that, even at 100% debt to GDP, um, to me, isn't that scary. At some point, we need to stabilize our debt. I think we could stabilize it at above 100% of GDP, and that would be fine. That will take additional effort to do, in particular, Social Security. Um, goes insolvent a decade from now, and bringing solvency to that system, I think, is both important in its own right and would get you about two-thirds of the way to where you'd need to go to stabilize the debt in a way that I'd be comfortable with. Um, you know, love people to do that tomorrow. If they do that four years from now, I'm going to be losing sleep over worries one through eight, not over that one. A question, front row. Hi. Um, I'd be interested in getting your perspectives on how much we should trust the markets when they're making predictions about the future. You talked about the interest rates. So I was just checking that the, the real yield interest rate is still negative up to five years and, and less than 1% going out a long distance. 
the um, five-year forward inflation expectations are about 2.2 or 2.3 percent. Um, are those numbers that we should be worried about? And if not, how much should we discount what the collective markets are saying compared to what others are saying? I certainly have a view, but if somebody go, ahead. go for it. First. Go ahead. Uh, you know, the case for being sanguine on inflation is that the least bad predictor of inflation in the past was long-term inflation expectations. And long-term inflation expectations, whether measured by markets um, or by economic forecasters or by consumers, are all in a perfectly fine place. Um, as I said, those were the least bad predictors in the past. They were never that good a predictor. I worry we're in a slightly different paradigm now. Also worry that some of those market prices, especially in thin markets like tips, are distorted by the huge holdings um, that the Fed has. And I think the market is sort of overly sanguine about there not being 4% Fed funds rate a year and a half from now. So um, I take some comfort from it, but it's not enough to keep inflation from being probably number one um, on my worry list. I just worry about how reliable the price signal is given the size of the Fed balance sheet. I mean, think about the magnitude, what is it, $8 trillion, $9 trillion? It's pretty staggering, and so I, I worry about whether we're getting the price signals we should be getting. You think the Fed waited too long? In my mind, yes. The Fed. So I hope the Fed reconsiders the whole paradigm they adopted whenever it was a couple of years ago when they, when they said, you know, inflation expectations are so important. When we run inflation below 2% for an extended period, we've got to run above so that the world is convinced we'll stay at about 2%. You overlay that with the idea that if it does kick up, it's transitory, and it's like a guaranteed recipe for being behind the curve if inflation, in fact, does accelerate. And that's exactly what happened, in my view. They, they waited way too long. I mean, why were we still buying mortgage-backed securities in March of this year when they finally ended? It should have been over a, a, a year before that. Other questions? There's one in the back there. One. And maybe we'll get to two. Hi, uh, Jack Denton from Barron's. I have a question for the senator and uh, Dan Schulman as well. So you, you, you reached some consensus on uh, payment stable coins like Tether or USDC being uh, regulated. But I'm, I'm curious uh, why you might not think that algorithmic stable coins shouldn't be regulated the same way. After all, it was Terra, an algorithmic stable coin, you know, that wiped out $45 billion in two tokens in a couple days. Uh, you know, fueled losses in the wider crypto market 10 times that, and by some analyst measures, you know, that, that selling leaked into equity markets. You know, algorithmic stablecoins are supposed to always be redeemable for $1, just like Tether and USDC. Should they not be regulated the same way? Go ahead, Senator. So I'll go first. Um, so first of all, I, you know, you can have a truly decentralized algorithmic stablecoin, and who would you regulate? What, what would you require? You could say disclosure. You've got an open source code on the protocol. What more disclosure is there than that? And then the third point I would make is I, I, I'm, I don't believe you necessarily have to protect people from themselves. It strikes me as a highly speculative device. The mechanism to ensure the value is very dubious. But people wanted to speculate on that. They were being promised huge returns. Maybe you got an argument for fraud. Maybe people were misrepresenting the nature of this animal. But you know, people lose money on commodities and on speculation all the time. I don't think it's the job of the government to protect them from themselves. I, I think when you have um, asset-backed stable coins, now you have a very realistic mechanism to retain the value. And, and my regulation is mostly about disclosure. Like, make sure this is fully disclosed. Everyone in the world knows what they're buying if they buy a, a stable coin that's backed. And You'd have um, auditing requirements. You'd have to be have very clearly defined redemption policies. Um, you, in my view, I'd, I'd like to see a, a, a new charter, a sort of a narrow bank charter offered by the OCC for, for issuers that want to do just that. But, but the, the other, and my last point is that the, the stable coin that is backed by securities, clearly there is a potential for a mechanism to, to affect the broader financial market where I just don't see that in the algorithmic coins. Dan, quickly, you want to jump in? Uh, I think the senator did a, a thorough job on, on that. One last very quick question here, and then we're going to wrap up. 
Great, thank you. Uh, my name is Atoka. Um, I'm, I'm a global shaper from Japan. Just out of curiosity, uh, what are your personal predictions of um, interest rate uh, increase in June's FOMC? So whether it's 50 basis points, 75 basis points, or do you think it would decrease to 25? That's 50 with certainty. They've said that. The open question is whether they deviate from that after June. Um, probably not, but maybe. I don't know. June, I would July. agree with Jason. Sorry. I... No, I mean, that's what they, they've been very clear in publicly communicating that strategy. Yeah, exactly. I'd like you all to join me in thanking <laughs> our panelists for really fascinating. <laughs>